Greetings, everybody, and welcome to our updated talk on the diagnosis and management of COPD. And I'm going to change my pen color to red here because we're going to be looking at some radiographs. And uh, what I really want to impart to you here is how we diagnose this, uh, the pulmonary function tests, the radiographs, and the management uh, for COPD. This is super, super common. It will come up on your exam, whether you're taking step one, two, or three. And it's also uh, something that you will frequently see if you are working internal medicine and you're on the wards. You will see COPD exacerbations. If you're family practice or internal medicine in the clinic, you're going to be managing these patients um, they're, it's very, very common. And the problem is um, these patients are smokers. A lot of times they continue to smoke despite having COPD and smoking is very, very common in the United States. Fortunately, decreasing, but still very common, especially older people. They smoked for a very long time. And so COPD is still, unfortunately, very common in this country. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already stepped up to donate. Okay, so let's get started. Um, we are going to go over the essentials of COPD, uh, some of the symptoms, how we work this up. We'll go over a little bit of the basic science here just as a refresher. Um, and then we'll talk about the treatment. And I'm going to save uh, what not, or at least when to admit um, for my next talk that I'm going to update, and that is on COPD exacerbations, which is a, uh, a, a complication of chronic COPD. So COPD, it stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and it's defined as a disease state characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow obstruction. So what kind of pulmonary disease is this? It's an obstructive, it's an obstructive pulmonary disease, not restrictive. About 75% of patients with COPD are longtime smokers, according to the American Lung Association. Many of the rest of them are idiopathic. There is a genetic disorder called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. It's very uncommon. Fewer than 1% of COPD patients have that. There are two pathologies behind COPD. Number one is emphysema, and emphysema is due to destruction of the alveoli from chronic inflammation, and that results in a loss of elasticity um, due to destruction of the uh, interstitium of the lungs and of the, uh, the alveolar walls. And that, in turn, results in a decreased surface area for oxygen exchange. So you're probably thinking along the lines of DLCO, which we talked about in our physiology talk. If you are unfamiliar with that, you should probably go back and watch that video. Chronic bronchitis is due to excessive secretion of mucus, and that results in a productive cough, and that's going to be defined as daily for at least three months for at least two years. Most patients with COPD have features of both, so this is not a one or the other thing. Most patients will have um, some emphysema and some chronic bronchitis. Sometimes maybe more one than the other, uh, but generally they'll have um, symptoms of both. There is a wide age range of diagnosis. It a lot of times just depends on how frequently they smoke, the age they started smoking at. Um, so early symptoms can be apparent in their 30s, but most of the time this doesn't get diagnosed until their later 40s, 50s, early 60s. COPD exacerbations, which is not the topic of this talk, is an acute worsening of symptoms often, I should say often, brought on by an infection or congestive heart failure, air pollution, or some idiopathic factor. This is defined technically as an increase in dyspnea from their uh, baseline uh, or uh, and or uh, an increase in sputum production. Now, this is what we see in uh, in a normal 
uh, histology of the lung. So what you're looking at here are alveoli, and you can see it's very delicate and lacy in appearance, uh, but you see these uh, alveoli next to one another uh, with these, uh, with these, um, th these walls here. Um, so this is normal in appearance, and I have, I have a sort of a lower power here and a higher power here. Now let's compare this to what you see in emphysema. So notice here that you have a destruction of the walls. So basically what's happening is apparently the alveoli are larger. Now you might think, well, that might be good because larger alveoli means more gas exchange. No, it's surface area. We're thinking of surface area. If the alveoli become bigger, you actually have less surface area. So compare this to this, more surface area. So more surface area, more gas exchange. Less surface area, less gas exchange. And that is the problem with emphysema. What are the risk factors? Cigarette smoking, number one risk factor. You will be more likely to, de uh, to develop COPD with age. For some reason, white people are more likely to develop COPD than other races. And then there are some other minor risk factors like exposure to air pollution and occupational exposures. The symptoms, productive cough, that is characteristic of chronic bronchitis, shortness of breath, progressive dyspnea, and wheezing. On physical exam, it's very variable, uh, but you'll see things like barrel chest and hyper resonance, that's due to air trapping. Uh, you'll often hear wheezing and coarse crackles. The wheezing is typical of the emphysema. The coarse crackles is due to the mucus in the airways um, that we see with chronic bronchitis. Remember, most patients have features of both. Later, they will go on to develop cyanosis, clubbing, a loud P2 sound that is due to pulmonary hypertension and an increased JVP. That's due to something called core pulmonale. So that is because you have right-sided congestive heart failure. Why does this happen? Well, because you have chronic hypoxia, you get vasoconstriction of the arterioles. And so with vasoconstriction, you're going to have increased load on the right heart. It's got to pump harder because there's more resistance. And with time, that's going to cause right ventricular hypertrophy, and that's core pulmonale. And eventually, you can develop uh, jugular venous distension, swelling, and so forth. That's very late stage COPD. Uh, to diagnose this, a lot of times it's just diagnosed clinically, but the best test is going to be pulmonary function tests. Now, I say it's the best test because that's what we typically do. However, the most accurate test is going to be biopsies. Uh, remember, I showed you the biopsy. That's how you can definitively diagnose it. But in practice, we do pulmonary function tests, and that's what you should go with on your exam. Okay, uh, so what would we expect to see for pulmonary function tests in COPD? You should know this. You should know this because I gave a talk on physiology of breathing. And so if you watch that video, this should be common sense. So we would expect to see an obstructive pattern. And you should know your obstructive patterns versus your restrictive patterns. So what we would see is a low FEV1. That means that their expiratory phase is prolonged. We would see a, a, a roughly normal to low FVC. And so consequently, because the FEV1 is low and the FVC is either normal or low, the FEV1 to FVC ratio is low. Okay, so that is very characteristic of an obstructive pattern. You should know that. The total lung capacity can be normal or it can be high depending on the stage, and that's due to the air trapping. And the DLCO is going to be low. Now, why is that important? Well, what the DLCO tells you is the efficiency of gas exchange. Now, if you've got a patient with asthma, 
They're going to have all of these because it is obstructive, but their DLCO is going to be normal because there's no problem with the alveoli. There's no problem with gas exchange. They get oxygen to their alveoli, they can exchange it just fine. The problem is getting it there. With COPD, there's a problem with gas exchange because they have lost alveolar surface area. So the DLCO is going to be low, and that is a way that you can differentiate asthma from COPD. Now, typically, we can differentiate it based on the history, um, you know, the risk factors. Asthma typically shows up in a younger patient. We would not expect to see asthma uh, showing up for the first time in an older person who's a long-term smoker. So typically, it's pretty common sense based on the history. But but as far as pulmonary function tests and you know labs that you can do, this is the way that you can distinguish asthma from COPD. So here's your obstructive versus restrictive patterns. You should know this cold. And remember the DLCO is going to be low in COPD and normal in asthma. All right, now if we are looking at spirometry, this is going to be what's normal. And again, I go over this in my other talk. If you're dealing with an obstructive pattern, you're going to expect to see an increase in volumes. So everything's going to be transposed up. And then what's going to happen is you're going to get a slow expiratory phase, and it'll be something like that. Okay, so the amount of air that's breathed out in one second is the FEV1, and so we would expect to see something like this. So here, I'm going to put this in blue, uh, this was your FEV1, this volume here. And when you had your uh, COPD, this is your FEV1. So it's a decreased FEV1. Again, I go over this in that talk, so if you're confused, go back go back over there. Now, your flow volume loop is um, in the context of an obstructive disease. We would expect to see higher lung volumes, so we might start out here. And typically, the inspiratory phase is normal, but it's the expiratory phase that's the problem. So initially, in the expiratory phase, it's pretty normal, but then you get this prolonged um, pattern here. And I didn't draw it perfectly, but what you're looking at here is the slope. Okay, so you're going to get this prolonged expiratory phase. And that's typical of asthma or COPD. Now, there's a measurement called the uh, FEF2575. You can go look that up, but that is the first parameter to change. And I'm not going to go over that because it's not commonly um, tested, uh, but it is something worth knowing that that's the first to change. Now, the differential for COPD, we kind of went over this. Asthma, uh, COPD is generally not reversible with a bronchodilator, uh, whereas asthma is. Asthma also typically presents in younger patients. Cystic fibrosis is not going to present for the first time in a 50-year-old. <laughs> Um, so you would suspect this in a child, history of meconium ileus or malabsorption. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can cause emphysema. It's a lot more rare. You would expect to see this in a non-smoker or a patient under the age of 40. Maybe they smoke. If they have, a, uh, if they have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and they don't know it, they start smoking, they're going to develop COPD very quickly. Um, this is very easily tested with the alpha-1 antitrypsin levels. The workup, as mentioned, pulmonary function tests. Um, arterial blood gases are useful to get initially to look for CO2 retention. Chest x-ray, you'll see diaphragmatic flattening, possibly an elongated heart and substernal air trapping. EKG is useful to get because we're looking for, uh, for cardiac changes, so you may see a low QRS amplitude. There may be right axis deviation if you are uh, getting right ventricular hypertrophy. Remember that that is a late finding on your way to core pulmonary. You can get an echocardiogram if there are signs of congestive heart failure or right ventricular hypertrophy, and all patients should get the pneumococcal vaccine and the influenza vaccine every year. So that should be immediate when you diagnose a patient with COPD.
All right, so what I have here is normal on the left. So notice we should be able to see seven, eight, or nine uh, ribs. So you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, kind of. So that's about normal. Now, what do we see on the right here? We see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you're seeing ten ribs, you probably have hyperinflation. Notice here that we also have a nice curving of the diaphragm, whereas here it's a little bit less curved. So that's diaphragmatic flattening. And then what you see here is a nice kind of teardrop shaped heart. That's normal. What you see here is an elongated heart. It's kind of being pulled down from the diaphragmatic flattening. And that's pretty characteristic also with COPD. Now, another thing that you would see if you were to get a CT, you would see it more prominently at least, uh, is something called the saber sheath trachea. So that means that you have a coronal dimension that's less than two thirds of the sagittal dimension. In other words, basically what you're dealing with here is instead of a trachea that's roughly circular, you're gonna have something that's more like that. And that is pathognomonic for COPD. You're not gonna see it in everybody, but when you do see it, it's COPD. So here's normal and here's the saber sheath trachea. The management is smoking cessation number one. That is going to uh, reduce mortality. Now, how we go about this with medication, whether we use a short-acting beta agonist, long-acting beta agonist, long-acting muscarinic um, antagonist, it depends on their stage. Now, typically with COPD, in most patients, we're going to be going with uh, a long-acting beta agonist and a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Um, and so there are a number of inhalers that have both, and they're, they're, um, they're measured and dosed properly, so you're not taking two inhalers necessarily. Uh, but this is typically what we do because this is where most patients are at. I'm going to show you an algorithm in a little bit. All patients are going to get the pneumovax. All patients are going to get their yearly influenza vaccine. And whether or not they're on home oxygen depends on their PO2 and oxygen saturation. So under 55 millimeters of mercury or under 88% saturation, they're going to get home oxygen. If they have core pulmonale, uh, then we are, and I didn't put this here, if they have core pulmonale, we have a slightly uh, higher um, uh break line here. So if their P PO2 is less than 60 millimeters of mercury or their oxygen saturation is under 90, um, then we are going to uh, start home oxygen. And what we want to do is we want to tit titrate them up to an oxygen saturation of 90. We do not want to exceed 95. That, that creates problems. What we don't do is we don't give expectorants or mucolytics, even though they're coughing stuff up, we don't do that. And we don't administer cough suppressants. What they've got in their bronchi, we want them to get rid of it. So we do not administer cough suppressants, even though they're coughing. This is an algorithm here. Um, you're not going to be expected to know this for your exam, but clinically we do this. There's um, these two measurements, uh, MMRC and CAT, uh, those are based on um, functional impairment. Um, so uh, usually we sit right here uh, for most patients. Now you can go up by administering uh, inhaled corticosteroids or some patients with very, very, very mild COPD may just need PRN albuterol. Um, just depends on where they're at, but most of the time they're sitting right here. 